And that will bring us to item number six on our agenda, which happens to be public comment. Um, please make sure prior to coming up to the podium that you have signed in at the back of the room or at the podium itself with your name and your address before you come forward to speak. Public comment is limited to three minutes, and I will enforce that time limit. There are a lot of you here tonight, and I want each and every one of you who has an interest in speaking to us to have the opportunity to do so. There is a timer on the wall that you can look to periodically if you would like to, to make sure that you are on time with your prepared comments. If your comments do pertain to an action item that may be limited, may be listed later on this agenda, um, I would ask that you wait until that item comes up for discussion to make your comments. You will be allowed time to comment after the board discusses the item, but before the board votes on the item. Comments made by the members of the public that are related to any disciplinary actions, whether past, present, or pending. Other matters which could be the subject of grievance processes uh, are repetitious or comments that are derogatory of any person, business, or organization will be ruled to be out of order. Likewise, comments specifying the name of any student, employee, or individual will be ruled out of order. If you would like to make a public comment at this time that is not related to an agenda item that is labeled as action later on, please state forward, step forward and begin by stating your name and your address. Good evening, my name is Tara Arnett. Uh, tonight you're going to hear a lot of public comments and many will revolve around a single theme. Special education in the Columbia Public Schools is broken. Teachers are afraid and not properly trained Parents must secretly record, and many of them are doing so. Senior staff are unresponsive to concerns, and junior staff are feel fearful for their jobs. Let me repeat that. Sp special education in the Columbia Public Schools is broken. The largest department in the school district is underserving its population, even though the staff to student ratio is less than one to four. You as a board have an opportunity to change that. You have an opportunity to make changes to discriminatory policies and to ineffective leadership. Legislators are ready to file bills, lawsuits are being prepared, and policy legal violations have been uncovered. Special education in the Columbia Public Schools is broken. Listen to the parents tonight, listen to the students tonight, listen to them, and please work to serve our community. We can be better, we can actually become what we aspire to be in this community, inclusive of everyone, and have an education system that prepares all students to be productive members of society. But you have to take action. Your stubbornness on the recording policy is a public relations nightmare that could have easily been avoided. We've now heard this week that you authorize construction of seclusion units that resemble solitary confinement cells for students, and they were used in an unfinished condition against school policy. At the June school board meeting, we heard story after story after story about how the special services department continues to fail our students. Special education in Columbia Public Schools is broken. Are you willing to fix it? Because as voters, as parents, as condition, Constituents, as students, as community members, we're not willing to stay silent about it any longer. Well, personal story. Imagine preparing to send your not yet five-year-old son to public schools. You sit around a table, about 15 professionals sitting in front of you, to talk about your child's future in the school district. And you're advocating for this child to attend specials with his peers. An educator across the table looks at you and says, well, most of the kids in this classroom don't do that. You see, they, this is a spring meeting before his kindergarten year, and they've never even met him, never laid eyes on him. But that was the first time my son had ever been judged for his diagnosis and not his capabilities. You see, he has low verbal autism, and this teacher passed a judgment on my beautiful, perfect four-year-old. And then you have to keep it together for the rest of the meeting. And remember all the other education stuff you've talked about in that meeting without being upset. My son is going to middle school next year. He's 10. This is my reaction from when he was four. So I have a standing invite to that middle school IEP meeting. It's coming up. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Amy Saladay. My children go to Alpha Heart Lewis. We are part of the trusty Husky family. I want to take a minute tonight to recognize all of our students in the audience. 
who have IEPs and 504. We are proud of you. You should be proud of you. This is a first. This is the first time that at a school board meeting, we're taking a minute to recognize those of you with disabilities. You didn't win an award. You didn't get a perfect score on the ACT. You didn't win in state track or tennis. But many of our students are here tonight advocating for what they need, and we honor that. This school board doesn't know what it's like. They don't know what it's like for you as students to not be able to do everything else that your peers can do. They don't know what it's like to maybe not look like everyone else, to act like everyone else, or to get frustrated by things that other kids don't get frustrated by. They don't understand the pain that your parents feel at these special education meetings with not being able to just fix it. You have a disability. Some of them can't see your disability, but that doesn't mean that you don't struggle. But as your parent, we get you. Just as we stand here fighting for what we need as your parents, you must learn to also fight for what you need. You as our students with disabilities will have to fight to graduate from high school, to go to college, to live independently, and to be employed. Some of you will have to fight to get married and to vote and to be accepted by your peers. Discrimination against children and their parents is wrong. But we are here with you. <coughs> we stand for you, beside you, and we are your biggest cheerleaders. We embrace your differences. That's what makes you special. Without the struggle, you would not be strong, and you are strong. May this school board recognize that having the right supports for both you as students and your parents can change the trajectory of your lives. May this school board understand that having the right to record gives these students the opportunities to succeed, not only in school, but also in life. And may you as students that are here tonight, may you know that there are adults in your corner willing to help fight for what you need, that would understand your daily struggle and that by coming here tonight and advocating for yourselves, you have already succeeded. Thank you. Pass it around. Good evening. I'm Dr. Janice Dawson III, founder and executive director of Grade A Plus Incorporated. I come this evening as my tradition to come to the first school board meeting each year to introduce our organization to the um, school board. <laughs> um, half of you have visited our program, half of you have not. Um, the materials I'm uh, sharing with you are to help you to know a little more about what we do. And I guess the overall or title of the message is the community is working with the schools to help the children in our uh, community. We don't feel the schools can do everything. It has to be a three-prong process. It has to include the family, the school, and the community. And so we're a part of that. We try to work with the school system. We try to interact with the teachers. We definitely interact with the parents. And um, if anything, based on the information I'm giving you, it's an update, a report. I bring you something written every year. It's an update and a report to let you know how we're doing statistically. But one of the concerns I do have uh, and hope uh, that it can improve. And I would like to say that Dr. Steepleman has been the first superintendent out of five that I have worked with that does communicate with the communi community and with me and this program. Um, but I'm concerned that we're being more and more restricted in our ability to communicate with the schools themselves and the teachers themselves. And uh, the way you all are structuring the schools, the parents are being pushed out more and more Everything is internet. Um, it's very difficult for our families to communicate. Work schedules, all kinds of things make it um, difficult for them to communicate with you within your window of convenience. And so that's where we come in. We're here to help. We can come to the school and check on their child while they are at work in Jeff City or in Fulton. We can follow up with a teacher 
where they cannot afford to take a day off of work to come and see what the issue is. We can do the homework with that child if the teacher would send the materials to us and not wait for the, the child to pull it out the book bag at 10 o'clock at night for the parent. So we're asking for more support from the schools to allow us as what you call third party purveyors to assist our children in the community to succeed in school. I don't know, I, I have 32, 30 seconds. I, I do enjoy, I've done this 20 years for those of you that don't know me. We are now a funded organization. I started by doing this out of my pocket, but we are now supported by the city of Columbia and we're now supported by Heart of Missouri United Way and we're supported by people who support with their individual dollars. So we're doing the job, we're doing the work, but I'm asking you as a school system, let us in, let us in. You can't do it all by yourself. I have a parent here who would like her own three minutes. Hi, my name is Michelle Seymour, and I also, I have two children who um, I started the program probably about January of 2017. And um, I was like a helicopter mother. Um, I, my kids were used to me staying at home. And so I, I kind of waited on the sidelines while I was telling my kids to get in there and um, get advocated into the program. Um, since then, I have seen a huge difference in my children. Um, we, my daughter, the reason I got involved is because my daughter was in the fifth grade about that time. And she's like, Mom, I have homework. And I'm like, what kind? And she said math. And I was trying to teach her how I learned <laughs> old school. And she's like, I don't understand any of this. You are confusing me more than helping me. And I'm like, oh gosh, well, what do I do? And, I, and then I'm like, where's your book? And of course, you all don't have books. You have computers. And, and so it was just very frustrating for me as a parent to try to help my child. And um, so I found out about grade A plus, and um, immediately I was excited because they actually have tutors for <coughs> math specifically. And, um, and it's one-on-one -on -one a lot of times with the tutor. And these are college students that come in from the university. And so my children are doing wonderful now. Um, we've also learned to swim. Um, I also was afraid to put my head underwater, and since then we swam underwater and stuff. So anyway, I'm just excited about the program, and I want to encourage other parents who are like helicopter parents, a little worried or nervous about it, come on in, you know. And um, I started out as a volunteer. Um, because I was there at the door anyway, <laughs> so I was letting children in, and so um, Dr. J is like, are you coming back Thursday? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and so she, anyway, I ended up um, working there with them, and um, it's just a great organization. Um, we always need volunteers, um, people who have like in businesses, you can come and share with our children what you're doing, why you're excited about it, because these are our future. They're gonna be setting up there someday. They're gonna be, you know, hammering and building things. So volunteer and um, just come over. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, I'm Deborah Smith. Um, I have two children that actually um, was a part of grade A plus program on last year, as well as my niece. Um, I must say that um, the program, my kids plus my niece actually enjoyed going there. Instead of me saying, hey, you're going, they were looking forward to going because they built a bond with those um, tutors there. And it made it, the kids feel as though what they're asking is that they were, that they were competent and they made them feel more confident in, in their studies. So I must say that all three of the kids did improve, especially my daughter uh, in math. She was good at math anyway, but it's her emotional, sub it's her emotional subject. It'll make her cry. Or so so 
uh, I must say that her confidence was built, uh, built up in uh, just attending grade A. And my niece, who always kind of struggled with uh, math, had improved as well. And my son just loved, just, he was all for it, wanted to go. So I encourage any parent who is having children that you know, need extra help or, hey, they're already good, but uh, now they want to uh, be better. Uh, I encourage any, any parent to actually take their kids there because it is a welcoming and warming uh, environment. Um, and I must say that if my kids uh, want to go, I think any kid would probably actually want to go there. So I fully support the program. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kate Canaber. Um, I'm here to talk about the IEP recordings, and I have to say this actually resembles some of the IEP meetings I have gone to because I have twins. And in the space of expediency, we often schedule those meetings back to back. I think once I was in a three hour IEP <coughs> meeting. And, you know, there's the principal, um, there's the counselor, there's the special ed teacher, there's a classroom teacher, often a behavioral specialist from the district. And, and that's not just counting if there's something that we're discussing in their IEP roadblocks. I think we've actually had up to 12 people in a meeting for one of my kids. And although I have had some amazing experiences with CPS administrators and teachers and principals, I won't name any of them because I'm not supposed to do that, but many of them are in this room. Um, they have each other to rely upon. They have each other's notes to rely upon. They have each other's memories of the meeting to rely upon. I only have me. It's just me facing up to 12 people trying to just do the best for my kid. And that's what this is about. You know, I hear one of the main things that is against this is litigation. And I can tell you, like, as a special needs mom, I've got no time to sue anyone. There is absolutely no spare time. <laughs> and so it's like, I think that that, I mean, I have to, I just have to say, I, I just don't get that. Because we in believe in working with the school district, or we wouldn't be coming to these meetings. We wouldn't be there. You know, I'm really lucky to be extremely privileged to, you know, be able to come in, come to these meetings, take time off, and be there and research and call. But I don't just go in there for my kids. I go in there for kids whose parents don't have the time, the ability to do this. There are parents that are facing second languages, that have a, you know, other kind of barrier. Um, so many of us special needs parents have our own things going on, we're a little spectrum me ourselves. So it's really hard to be in that room and concentrate and remember every single detail and take notes. And when you have two kids like mine, we often end up jumping back and forth and I can't remember if we're discussing one twin or if we're discussing the other twin. And I can't get all that down. Um, you know, and then the last thing is, is that you know, my kids are taking charge of their own education. They want to be in charge. They're in middle school, they're going to high school, we expect a lot of these kids. Why would we not give them the ability to go back and listen to this, hear what is said, and you know, make sure it's put into action. Let's give them the authority to do that. You know, I hear things can't be said in these meetings. Those things can be said outside of those meetings, but actions need to be enshrined in an IEP meeting. That's why we have meetings. That's why we have someone there as a representative doing this. And recordings only add to that. We say that integrity and transparency are CPS values. I cannot think of anything more transparent than a recording. Thank you. Brandon Saladay. I would like to thank Paul Cushing for inviting me to this meeting last Friday when I stopped by his place of work to visit with him for the second time about the recording policy. He is taking his time to listen. I would also like to thank the board members for volunteering their time. A little background on myself. I'm a farmer and electrician. I was able to stay on the honor roll and was pushed to never fail a class. While I had no enjoyment with the curriculum, like most kids with learning disabilities, I hated school. We learn differently and without schools making accommodations for how we learn, we can't learn. I needed three credits my senior year to graduate. I chose to obtain these three credits by participating in the COE program, working rather than being at school. Three years after high school, I attended Lynn State Technical College studying to be an electrician. I then completed a five-year apprenticeship program and have always managed the family farm in addition to doing electrical work. 
At age 30, I stopped going to my daily job and started staying home with the first baby. I could see almost immediately that my children had the same struggles with learning that I had. Years later, I find myself in an IEP meeting being the only expert there. You see, I have the same disability my children. My youngest was being denied the IEP. I pleaded with the team trying to explain that I had this disability that did not allow me to take notes in these meetings. Like the team was, everyone had a notepad or a laptop but me. And I know what it feels like to be in school struggling. My family is fortunate that we could hire a parent's advocate, Dr. Laura Wakefield, to be at the meetings and that our self-employment allowed both my wife and I to attend meetings. Dr. Wakefield recognized by law that the team should have stopped the meeting and provided a recording due to me notifying them that I had a disability that I couldn't understand and take notes at the same time. They didn't stop the meeting. My wife put together a letter in, to the school board asking to record due to my disability. To my knowledge, my family is the first granted permission to record any IEP meeting. We know that we are privileged, privileged to both be able to attend these meetings, privileged to hire Dr. Wayfield, privileged to record the meetings, but that isn't the way it is for everyone else. Later, my wife and I were invited to this very building for a meeting to learn that Eliza has not had not been evaluated properly and that she was eligible for an IEP. For over 10 years, children that have been held back, then evaluated for an IEP, have not been properly evaluated. So I stand here fighting today for families that are not privileged to hire a parent's advocate and also have an attorney present at all meetings. It doesn't make sense to me the school board should not go ahead and vote for this reporting policy. Thank you, everyone. Hello, my name is Sarah Rivera. You have all heard that many arguments changing, uh, for changing the recording policy. I want to tell you about my reason for wanting this change. I want to under you to understand what it is like to sit on my side of the table in an IEP meeting because no matter how many IEPs you may have sat through as a staff member for a school, until you are the parent and they are talking about your child, you cannot fully understand the feelings. So let's change the scenario to be something that you may be able to relate to. Imagine you've gone to the doctor for some routine blood work or taken a parent or child to the doctor for a nagging cough that just won't go away and before you can process what's going on, you've been blindsided by a diagnosis that is life-altering. Perhaps it's cancer or MS or Alzheimer's. Can you imagine how grateful you would be at the end of, of the consult if the doctor said, I know that was overwhelming news, so I recorded it and here it is so you can listen back to our conversation at home. Let's make sure you remember all that has been discussed so that you can make the best decisions about treatment. I can speak from personal experience that both an IEP and that kind of diagnosis of a loved one are equally overwhelming and a recording of the meeting would, be do, would do nothing but help all parties involved. Last year at my son's reevaluation IEP, my husband and I were blindsided by a secondary qualifying diagnosis that was previously not even hinted at by teachers, therapists, or caseworkers. I was completely blown away that the evaluation had come to that conclusion and though I continue to respond to questions, believe me when I tell you that I was pretty hung up on what they had just told me, trying to make sense of it and therefore missing parts of what was being said in the meeting. A recording would have helped us feel like we had, we, that we hadn't missed anything. It would have helped us not go to, um, back to his teachers repeatedly for clarification. It would have helped us know that we had made the best IEP decisions for our son that year. A recording of his next IEP meeting would have shown school officials how one of the staff had, pre had made predetermination statements about my son's future, which I'm sure you all know they should not be doing. Even the cable company records calls for quality assurance and training purposes. Shouldn't our, <laughs> shouldn't our school district want at least that much, if not more than the cable company? I have heard an argument against making this policy change because no one else in the state has a policy that allows parents to openly record these meetings. I don't know if any of you feel that way, but I can't help but point out the flaw of this thought process. At one point, people of color and women were not allowed to own land or vote. Children with special needs were not allowed to go to schools with their typical peers and were shipped off to institutions. 
Those things changed because people stood up and said the status quo isn't good enough. Just because it's what has always been doesn't mean it's what should be. Will you be brave enough to stand up and say that we will be the model for change instead of the model for being stagnant? Good evening, my name is Christina Angolia. I teach English at Columbia College and I also have a four-year-old daughter with disabilities at ECSE. I'm here tonight to speak in favor of the open recording of IEP and 504 meetings, especially from a teacher's perspective. Currently, Missouri state law allows my college students to record any of my classes without my knowledge. While that is not something I loved when I first realized this was the law, it is something I live with. It forces me to be transparent and frankly, to be better prepared for class. Um, having said that, I would much prefer to know I am being recorded. There's a professional and interpersonal courtesy and protection in knowing this is happening as opposed to being in the dark about it. This also gives me the option to record as well so I can have a neutral recording if I ever needed it. Your teachers and students will benefit from an open recording policy too for many reasons. With knowledge of recording, all participants will behave more respectfully in situations where this has been a problem. Less problem behaviors mean less stress for teachers during meetings. All benefit, especially the child whose IEP or 504 is being written by a calmer group of adults. <laughs> Furthermore, when a meeting is recorded, there is an official record that can protect teachers. Disputes can be resolved by referring to the recording, which alleviates questions about what was said or what was meant. This will create less work for the administration too, as there will be less dispute resolution. And this will alleviate the need to call more and more and more meetings to clarify what had been meant in previous meetings meetings. This means that interactions will be recorded in a clear process and we will be less reliant on personality of parents and of staff to get this right. These recordings also protect teachers if a dispute ever rises to the level of a due process or child complaint hearing. They will have a transcript to help them remember, unlike what they have now, which is nothing. If I'm doing my job as a teacher and following policy, my students benefit and I have nothing to fear. If teachers are fearful, this suggests to me that they are not trained well enough to run or participate meaningfully in these meetings. The solution to this is not to block recording, but instead to give our teachers more support and resources to do better. In fact, recordings should be excellent training tools or could be excellent training tools for new teachers, potentially, with permission. I'm from another state where IEP and 504 recording is done by request. When I reached out to my friend, a SPED teacher there, to explain that we were being prevented from recording our IEPs, she literally asked, Christina, what's the big deal? That's how it is in so many other places. People are trained properly and recording is seen as simply something to plan for. For all of these reasons and so many more, I hope both you and our CPS teachers can see that this open recording policy would benefit all of us, but most especially our students. Thank you. Hi, I'm Emery Wakefield. I'm a senior at Rockbridge High School, and I have a 504 plan for generalized anxiety disorder, panic attacks, and depression. I want to discuss a situation about why I would like for my meetings to be recorded. It's about trust. You see, I don't have a lot of trust in the system, so I need to record. And I hear educators saying they don't want to be recorded because they are afraid of lawsuits. Well, I think that's a symptom of a deep problem that I noticed at my own 504 meeting. At my very first 504 in ninth grade, the nurse said something ex extremely disrespectful and invalidating to me. It was extremely painful, and I couldn't process the rest of the meeting. I had to leave out of the meeting, actually. I couldn't finish it because I had class and because of the emotional stress it caused me. Afterwards, I thought, how can I trust a person who talks like this? It was so unprofessional, and my friends have reported similar situations. So, I think if you are so worried about lawsuits, then maybe you should ask yourselves, what are you hiding? What are you doing and saying that you were afraid to go on record and say it? I will always be recording my meetings because that trust was broken in that first meeting when the nurse was disrespectful, rude, and invalidating. I don't want a lawsuit. 
but I wanted to be able to play that recording to her supervisor so that she could understand that what she was doing was detrimental to a student. Thank you for your time. Hello, I'm Jason Mice. Um, I went to school over at New Haven, and you talk about seclusion, about different things, different ideas to put people with disabilities into a place where a teacher hits you with a ruler and bruises you and yells at you each every day for anything and everything there is. And you talk about all this big stuff, but still, where's all the people before this all happened? Why haven't you all gotten seclusion taken care of in the first place? I'm still surprised that seclusion is still happening today. I would think after the ADA, when it was born, I was graduating from elementary school when it was born, that it would help you all to learn about seclusion and go into schools and see what it's about. You all need to step in our shoes and ask yourself, hey, what can I do to prevent this from happening again? And why is it happening? Why are people being punished just because of the way they act, walk, or talk, or look? There should be reasons to say, hey, Maybe we should stop this. Maybe we should take a look at this school and see what's going on before we do anything about it. Have meetings with the teachers. Go in and say, hey, what's going on? How can we help them? It, hurt, it nearly hurts me to see that it's still going on today. And I'm surprised you are allowing that type of deal where somebody is allowing somebody to get hurt by a teacher or put in a box or something else that should not be done. We're humans. We have much as right as you all do, going to college, getting a degree, learning. I own my own bakery. Thank God for that. If it wasn't for that, I don't know what I'd be. But still, you all need to go into the schools and start looking at them saying, hey, what's going on with this? Why ain't this all done the right way? Thank you. Hello. My name is Andy Roboto. I'm a father of three children, two of whom have special needs. As I was preparing my remarks, I asked my wife if the meeting would be recorded, and she confirmed that it would. My next thought was why, followed closely by how could a board see the value in recording board meetings, but miss the same point about IEPs and 504s. Even if the board is only doing it to satisfy a regulatory requirement, they must have thought about the risks and benefits. This led me to the realization that every argument against parents recording IEP and 504 meetings could equally be applied to board meetings. For example, one reason used to not support recording is that it's creepy. Does the board record meetings or even ask speakers to give their name and address in order to creep people out with the goal of stifling community engagement? Another reason was given that comments can be taken out of context. Does the board record meetings so they can play gotcha and release snippets of comments without context to make the speaker look foolish? A third explanation was that parents must want to record so they can use the recordings as evidence if they decide to sue the school. Does the board record meetings to use as evidence to sue community members? Despite being posed as rhetorical questions, I don't believe that those are any of the reasons why it's recorded. I believe it's actually done to ensure that there's a fair and accurate record of the meeting itself. What we are asking is to be given the same benefit that you all have been given. Don't assume malicious intent without evidence. Most special needs parents are too busy raising children with special needs to spend time plotting conspiracies. Give us the same respect we have given you and recognize that we want to record IEP and 504 meetings for the same reason that this meeting is being recorded to ensure that there's an accurate record of the meeting. The final question I want to address 
is how does this help the kids? When we moved to Columbia, it took several months to get a 504 evaluation meeting scheduled but for my daughter, but ultimately what we thought was a final meeting at which eligibility was confirmed and accommodations were agreed to. But when we received the document several days later, much of the conversation, including details of the accommodation, was missing. This ultimately led to having to get the entire team together again to re-meet about the same things that had already been decided. Rescheduling took months, and I want to clarify, none of that delay was on us. We were able to meet at any moment they were able to. Once the school was finally able to meet with us, the accommodations we had all agreed to before were affirmed. Had there been a recording, it would have taken a couple hours to sort out this confusion. But instead, my daughter had to wait months to get the services that everyone already agreed she needed. Those months were filled with her throwing up before school, daily visits to the school nurse, sleepless nights, and hours of crying every day after school. But they didn't even change the accommodations in any way. They just made it take longer to happen. She was made to suffer while adults discuss schedule availability. So the answer to how does this help the kids is it enables plans to be built and implemented in a reasonable time frame rather than have bureaucracy get in the way. Thank you for your time and attention. Hello, <coughs> Angela Rogers. Good evening, board members, Dr. Stiepelman, parents, students, teachers, staff, and community members. I'm a process coordinator with the Special Services Department. On June 10th, 2019, comments and concerns were shared from teachers and staff regarding the request to change district policy to allow recordings of IEP meetings. I trust that board members have taken time to review those comments and encourage those who have not to do so. Therefore, I will not take your time to rehash those concerns. Instead, I'd like, to take, I'd like to share with you some of the work our department has completed to help foster increased family, family participation and understanding of the IEP process. For the last year, under the leadership of our director and assistant director, through feedback provided by members of Como SEPTA, our department has worked tirelessly to bridge the relationship between parents, teachers, and the district as whole. This summer, the CPS Special Services website was revamped to make it more parent-friendly. There is a wealth of information on it to help guide parents through the IEP process and provide them resources along this journey. At the beginning of the school year, a welcome letter was sent out to all parents, guardians of, parents and guardians of special education students from our directors introducing our new website, sharing information about Como SEPTA, and explaining some beginning of the year processes to parents. If any parent has not received a copy of this letter, it is available on the special services website or you may ask your child's case manager. During back to school in services, we provided our secondary teachers training and reminders on the IEP process and how to foster a parent friendly relationship as well as conduct parent friendly IEP meetings. Our elementary specialists will be trained through professional development days and special education meetings. Two years ago, we began the process of pre-scheduling IEPs at the beginning of the year to assure parents had ample time to plan and prepare for IEP meetings and foster greater participation. As we move forward, we continue to examine our current practices and look for ways to make the IEP a document that best describes and meets the needs of each of our students. As such, when students undergo an evaluation, we have begun to revamp our impact statements to better describe each child's specific needs. As we transition to SRG, we are examining our goals to assure they align and fit with our district expectations. These are just a few examples of the work we have completed and continue to work on as we strive to find ways to learn and grow. We are proud of our work, our teachers, and our staff. But no, there is always room for improvement. We welcome honest, open, and respectful discussions that will improve outcomes for our students. Thank you. Hello, my name is Amy Van Morland. And when you really think about it, when you truly look at the values of the Columbia Public School System, the recording um, of these meetings would align with that policy. Trust empathy, transparency, integrity, collaboration, and grace. Let's start with trust. Trust has been lost on both sides. If you talk to both sides of the field here, there's trust that has been lost by the parents, and there's also trust that's been lost by the teachers. We need to start by rebuilding that trust. 
Well, how do we do that? Empathy, the capacity to understand or feel what another person is experiencing. Until it happens to you, you cannot truly understand what it's like, but you can try. I would like to invite each and every one of you and welcome you to my son's next IEP meeting. I would really appreciate it if someone would attend. I want to be transparent with you, and I want you to understand why recording is so important. Transparency implies openness and accountability. If you strive for openness and accountability like you say you do, why is there even a question about the recordings? We want to be transparent. There shouldn't even be a question about that. Integrity, the quality of being honest. If you strive for and say your words have integrity, what is in the harm in having them recorded? There shouldn't be a harm in that. And collaboration, when two or more people work towards a common goal, grace, courteous, goodwill. The majority of my mental effort during an IEP meeting is focused on maintaining my composure. Bracing myself for the phrases significantly below grade level does not meet expectations. When other parents are concerned about their child's grades and what college they're gonna get into, I'm thinking, will my son be able to hold a job? Will he be able to live on his own? And will he be happy? When I'm thinking those things, how can I focus on the rest of the meeting? Um, one statement that was made by a school administrator said, the plan should be the true recording of the meetings and school officials have an obligation to ensure that parents understand every word said in meetings. Re-listening to jargon and misunderstood words <coughs> wouldn't help parents. Well, let me tell you, at Danny, or I shouldn't say any words, at my son's last IEP meeting, I tried to understand every single word and our IEP meeting lasted five and a half hours over three different segments. I had a wonderful and for the most part amazing team that was very supportive and trying to help me understand every word. But it's not feasible, it can't happen. Um, and most importantly, my son is wanting to become more involved. However, he would not be able to sit through an IEP meeting. When I get home, people that know my son, he asks me a million questions. That is very exciting to me because he's wanting to be more involved. If he could listen to the recording, he would be more involved. And finally, grace, courteous goodwill. We often say among ourselves, just be kind. Mark Wakefield. I'd like to make uh, two points. One, it's difficult for my schedule. I have two children with 504s, uh, and it's very difficult with my schedule for me to be present. And though I trust my spouse, I'd like to verify and listen myself. Second, as a physician, uh, I'm often asked by patients to let me record our sessions, and this is controversial, but evidence shows that it improves the healthcare literacy of the patients, their understanding of the circumstances, and improves their outcomes. Thank you. Kate Chadwick Graham, and I am the parent of a child with a connective tissue disorder and joint condition. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of this so I don't miss anything and go over time. Um, I'm coming here as a heartbroken and angry mother because my child has pres prescription ankle braces he has to wear until he's an adult and probably beyond, and because of pain and fatigue he often uses a wheelchair now. My son is currently at Gentry Middle School, and the teachers and staff, who I will not name, are amazing, they're outstanding, I'm really grateful to them. But that's not where my son is supposed to be. He's districted to Jeff Middle School, which is out of ADA compliance and has been for decades. There's no grandfather clause. It will continue to be for an undetermined amount of time, but it sounds like years at a minimum. My husband has repeatedly asked the school district for the legally mandated transition plans so we can know when, and they either don't exist or they just won't provide them as they're required to do. Elevators only go to two of the four floors at Jeff. 
Because of my son's physical disability and the continual refusal of the staff to move my child's classes to accessible floors as required by 504, we can no longer make it up the stairs at all. He had to be transferred out of Jeff Jr. to a school that is mostly compliant with federal laws. For months, I resisted moving him from Jeff, but their solution to my son's problem was to hand him off to someone else. I tried to keep him there, but I couldn't because of his pain. I started homeschooling him because he would cry and ask why I was making him do something that caused him pain. And now, out of all seven middle schools in Columbia that you could have chosen to put the one and only STEAM school in Columbia, they chose the one school where physically disabled students cannot attend. There's a great deal of confusion as to which students will be able to attend this new STEAM school next year, but for sure it won't be any child with a physical disability that can't climb up and down stairs. However you decide is the fairest way to do this, which I've heard a lot of things and it doesn't sound great, but it is illegal and more importantly, it is immoral to have put that one opportunity for these students to be in a STEAM school, which will partially be a lottery school, to take that completely away from students like my son. These disabled students won't be able to go into construction necessarily or something like that. My son can't do that. But a technology and math school, science, those are things he can do with his brain. And this would have been a perfect opportunity for him. This year, he would have been at Jeff in that STEAM school. In the, they're only doing one STEAM class this year. But that's one class he would have been in. He would have had that hands on. And next year, he could have applied for one of those lottery spots. But no disabled kids can do that now. So I want to know, how do you justify doing that when there were six other choices? And what are you going to do about it now? I'll make sure everybody can see. Well, I hate following my wife. <laughs> I'm Chuck Graham. Uh, I'm here to honestly express my profound dismay and disappointment at the complete lack of preparedness and compliance district-wide with the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's no wonder that you have a variety of concerns here this evening because you haven't even completed the basic administrative requirements required by the Department of Justice for public entities to employ 50 or more people. A year ago, I wrote to Dr. Seidman and said, I would like to see, I'd like to know who the ADA coordinator is. I still haven't met that person. Um, I would like to see a copy of the transition plan. You have to have a transition plan that identifies every structural barrier in every single building, along with a plan for how you're gonna remove it and when you're gonna remove it. And that requirement has been there for 27 years, since 1992. I did get a packet of documents from the district this last week. They were 2006 building assessments. Among the things they said was Gentry is completely wheelchair accessible. But you just added two ramps to two trailers uh, last week because it wasn't. Um, so you do not have a transition plan in place. It also requires that you complete self-evaluation where you take a look at all of your programs, your activities, and your services and make sure they're accessible to and usable by individuals with disabilities. <laughs> so you would have been looking at things like your seclusion policy, perhaps your reporting policy, to make sure all of these things were compliant. But you haven't even done that simple administrative requirement. And you have to have a grievance procedure, that's number four. Um, I did file a grievance uh, with Dr. Stiefelman. Um, he and I are meeting, I'm very excited about that. I don't know if that's how the grievance process works, um, or if that's the official ADA grievance policy. Um, but I guess I'll be finding out. This lack of planning leads you to inexplicably bad decisions like picking the most inaccessible school in the district to make a STEAM school. And it leaves you so wide open to a class action lawsuit by parents of children with mobility disabilities because you're going to exclude them from an entire class of education because you picked the worst building in this district. I also want to um, support uh, the right to record. Number one, we have a right under state law. It's a one-party consent state. We already have a right to do it. You just have a policy that says that you're not gonna do that. It's also important because I've been lied to more than once um, in a 504 meeting. 
Um, and I've been told some very inaccurate information in 504 meetings. I know a little bit about 504. Um, if you have more than three minutes sometime, give me a call, I'll let you know. And one last thing, there's no specific accessibility requirement in the ADA for seclusion rooms for a reason. That's because no one 29 years ago thought you'd still be putting people in there. Dr. Wakefield, I'm a special education advocate, and I'm here today on behalf of one of my clients who asked me to come speak for him. He is a senior at Battle High School, and he wanted me to talk to the board and the superintendent about the word omission. Omission means you left something out, whether that was on purpose or an accident. It means you forgot it. You didn't include it. Uh, for example, I have the 2019 Battle High School yearbook here with me today. This is my client's yearbook. An entire group of special education students were completely left out of it. No pictures, no memories, their names aren't even in the index. Can you imagine what that was like for their parents and these students when they got home and opened it up and they were nowhere in it? My client cried and so did his mom. This is a written document of his school year, right? But you know that he was left out of it because I told you, because I'm having this conversation with you explaining to you he was left out of this. So the pages of this yearbook don't tell the whole story. Very similar to an IEP and a 504 meeting. You see the context that that happens in happens with a conversation. And there are lots of gaps that get filled in with that document when you have the conversation to refer back to. And that is why parents need a recording so that they can get the whole picture of the child. I think it's very important for you to consider policy KKB again, and please consider allowing parents and teachers to openly record it so that we can get the whole picture of the child in vital information like that is never forgotten again. Thank you. I'm Tanya Nirvana from, I'm a um, junior in high school now, and I wanted to support the ability to record in IEP meetings because as other people have mentioned, uh, it's very hard to take notes, and especially for someone like me who is able to participate in these, uh, in these meetings now. Uh, it is very hard sometimes to keep up with what people are saying, and I, like, over this summer, I took an online class, and I had to pause the video every few minutes in order to make sure I got every single note down, and it is simply infeasible to do that in a live situation where you have no access to what was said previously. You have to rely on what others have written down and there's too much chance for error in my opinion. It is simply ridiculous in my opinion that you cannot record during these things, especially where it is so crucial to how I will go through the rest of my school year. seeing anybody getting up um, I do now <laughs> hi my name is Amy Gott all of you have received an email from me Um, this is my son Hayden. <laughs> he uh, 
He had something he wanted to say, and I'm relaying it because he's a little shy. Um, he said that being restrained felt like I was being attacked, which scared me and made me angry. It made it hard not to trust them, not to hurt me again. See, Hayden has a disability. He has autism. My child's lost track of how many times he's been restrained. And I can ask him, what did it teach you? And he can honestly say, he still doesn't know. These restraint, isolation, padded rooms, shower stalls, whatever you want to call them. They're not just at core. I think that you need to treat children like they matter. <coughs> not just disabled children, but all children. Explain what they don't understand, because that's what a teacher does. You have some amazing, amazing SPED teachers, but those teachers' hands are forced. And I just thought that you should know. Stewart. A thousand percent did not plan on saying anything today. I'm so glad you brought up the seclusion rooms that are on the minds of everybody who has read the Tribune. Um, my child is a recent graduate of the core from last year. Um, so we are under the old system and I am deathly afraid of having to go back to this new system. Um, I just don't understand how we've gotten 10 years in that school of not having seclusion rooms. And all of a sudden, we're under this new program, and now we have seclusion rooms, where the old administration did not have them for 10 years. My child was there. They were not there. So I'm just wondering if the old administration was asked about how they run things. Can we contact them to see how things worked then versus now? And why are these things here when they weren't there before? Um, I, I have nothing else plain to say, but I just really would want you guys to reach out to the old administrators and the old teachers that were at CORE that ran that program successfully. In, in my case, it was successful for my child. But <coughs> when, why all of a sudden we are at the place that we are, where it's taken us back 10 years with um, just erased all the progress that we've made. So thank you, sorry. Good evening. My name is Demetria Stevens. Um, my grandkids, I'm speaking on behalf of my grandkids and piggybacking off of what she said, I was waiting for my cue, speaking about the, um, I don't know if you call them restraints, holds, I don't know what they're called, but I was surprised to know that this is happening. Um, I saw something that happened, someone sent me something, had a conversation with my grandson, unbeknown to me, that he was put in one of those boxes at the core. He is in the new program at High Roads. I am not happy. I am very, very furious to know that this happened. Yes, my grandkids, uh, several of them have some disorders that we are dealing with, but to restrain, um, seclude, close off, it is not acceptable. We have got to do something different. Again, like she said, I know that program and I've never heard of these rooms, but to see that, it made me ill today. So I'm asking you guys to think about the board as to what can we do different? Because that to me is a pipeline to prison. I spoke to my daughter. I 
spoke to my grandson's daughter, my, my grandson's mom today, and she was furious. And I told her, you will not come to this meeting because she has some anxiety and she's not always able to conduct herself accordingly. She's always in her, in her feelings. And it's OK to have those feelings, but there's a time and place for everything. But we definitely are going to have to do something different. This is not acceptable. The one thing I had encouraged her to do is to allow him to stay in Columbia Public Schools because her fear was, Mom, they're not going to do him right. I need to homeschool him. I, I, I fought her against that. And to know this, I'm not happy with Columbia Public Schools. I've always supported. I've advocated. I've been at 504s. I've sat in meetings. I'm blessed to be able to know the language that's used in those IEP meetings, 504 meet, meetings. I've done an IEP 504 for my daughter, got it done, and I felt very confident. And it, it's never a problem for me to sit like this. I can get with the best of them, conduct myself, articulate, ex understand, explain, demand what I want for my kids. But again, this right here, we got to do something different. I'm not happy with this. And I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be able to have this opportunity to stand before you guys, but we got to do something better than this. This is not a way to deal with our kids. And I'm not sure what type of restraints you guys have trained your staff to use, but you got to have the proper training, uh, training to be able to restrain a kid. I've worked in a level three, level four, and I didn't use the restraints that I was taught to use. So you got to learn how to use it. You can use some force, but least restrictive. So we got to do better. Y'all hear from me again. My name is Melanie Camden. I also wasn't going to speak tonight. I wasn't prepared. Um, I'm with SEPTA, so I am all for the recording policy. <coughs> Standing here today, you would not know I was an at-risk youth at one time. I was suicidal from the time I was five until just a few years ago. Suffered a lot of abuse. And I can honestly say that continuing the abuse in school, which I have heard a lot of these core kids say is their <coughs> reprieve from home where there is more abuse, is not the answer. These kids have so much to offer our community. I know because I was one. I am now studying pre-law and I want to work with at-risk kids, and I want to change laws. I have a child with special needs who also has behavior problems. I never restrain him. I also work with mentally disabled adults. I am NCI trained, and we never, ever seclude them, and only restrain them with the proper techniques that will not hurt them or us, and most of it is blocking. I don't know how some of these parents get their kids to go to school. I wouldn't want to go. I would probably have become violent 15 years ago if my mom had sent me to a school like this. CORE has so much potential to be the reform school, to be the school that brings in the humanities and therapy, gives these kids an outlet to express artistically and musically through animal therapy. These are things that I know from having friends who work at CORE say, this is what we need. These are the things that saved me. That's why I'm alive to stand up here and talk to you today. Some of my attempts were pretty serious. You have to think about this with these kids. You're going to lose them. This is not how you address them. Get the things in there that they need to let out this aggression, to stop taking it out on themselves and their peers and the teachers. It'll be a, such a better environment for everyone. Get retired and off-duty cops in there to help teach the classes, to break that stigma. Change it. CORE doesn't have to be the, oh, God, no, my kid can't go there. It can be the, yeah, finally, we're going to get some help. My kid is going to learn a different way to express themselves. But you can't seclude them, and you cannot hold them down, or you're going to keep having situations like this. So please, from someone who had a very rough childhood and didn't see a way out, to now is studying pre-law and raising two beautiful little boys, Please do what's right here. Thank you.
My name is Christian Basie, and I'm a parent of a child with special needs. <coughs> I'm breaking a 25-year precedent about speaking publicly about something other than my job. You've heard tonight from kids who have autism. You've heard about kids with physical disabilities and cognitive disabilities. We've heard about omissions of yearbooks. I know about an omission of a kid from a field trip. You've heard about seclusion and restraint. You've heard about parents who are scared, who are trying to understand what's going on in a meeting while they're thinking about 400 other things. And you've heard about some changes that were made. While those changes have been good, every single one of them was reactive. Not one was a proactive change from your department. When I had a conversation, and it was not a friendly conversation, with a high-ranking member of your special services department about the asking of recording a, an a, a, a IEP where I actually came in and said, hey guys, I want to make sure we get this right. I'm a little concerned because Kate and I, my wife, have kind of fallen on this one. This is on us, so I want to make sure that I understand this, so I'd like to record. The one person in the room who said we couldn't was from the central office. Not the principal, not the teachers, but from the central office. I got a call two days later that said, absolutely not, you will not be able to record. Not once in that 45-minute conversation did that individual ever ask me about my daughter. They said it was about policy, and they had to protect the school district. This is not about the school district. This is about understanding what is best for the kids. This is understanding about how to give them the best education, and we have been recording. We have been recording. So the policy only restricts the teachers from doing it, because parents are doing it. And one last criticism, I do have an issue with your public comment policy because I think that any First Amendment lawyer would take a look at that and say, you are, in fact, restricting content, which is a violation of the First Amendment. Thank you. anybody rising at this point and so uh, that will take uh, us to the end of our public comment period and bring us to our next section of the agenda which is the report of the board president